let's get into the Word and uh, just remain standing as I read from the book today of Hebrews chapter 6 and the 13th verse. We'll talk today, this is called uh, The Certainty of God's Promises to Abraham I'm about to read. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and I will multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of His purpose, He guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Turn to your neighbour and say, that is good news. That's the comfort you're all been searching for. For we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Father, we thank You, but by Your Holy Spirit, You are here today. You wanna reveal Your kindness, Your goodness, Your purposes, Your promises for our lives, for this church, for this city and this nation. We celebrate You today, Jesus. You are the author and the perfecter of our faith in God. We give You all the glory today for You are worthy to be praised. I pray that in the simplicity of these next few moments and these statements that are about to be read, that God, Your Name would be elevated, Your truth be revealed, hearts be set free, healed and delivered, God, that we would walk out encouraged by the God we serve the God who surely will bless and multiply us. In Jesus' Name, everyone shouted. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the house of God here on July the 4th weekend. Are there any proud Americans in the house today? What a great time of the year. I love it all. I embrace every celebration, Uh, Thanksgiving, everything. I'm just, I'm American now. And so fireworks, I haven't done the fireworks personally myself. I haven't got the backyard for it, but you know, one day. One day and uh, just, you guys celebrate everything. You'll find a reason to celebrate it and you will do it up to the nth degree. And there will be that paraphernalia. You just do things well, you celebrate well. That's what I love about this great nation. And of course, we are celebrating Independence Day. The title of my sermon today is called Dependence Day. (laughs) Before you throw this skinny white Australian out of the church, I want you to recognise that we're talking about essentially maybe two different things here. In 1776, Thomas Jefferson and others, Franklin and Adams, formed a declaration. The declaration says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Some good things in there, some amazing things. I was reading that the motive and the intent of these men in declaring this uh, independence declaration was not so much for the individual equalities and liberties of each of us alone, but their intent and their heart behind this was more for the corporate America to choose to govern itself. How many know that's a good thing to be able to govern yourself and not be under oppression or the tyranny of the Brits? (laughs) But it was essentially that, that 
Every nation has a right not to be under the oppression and the tyranny and the rule of others. And it had some pros and cons for it along the way after the revolution then became some of the more expanded uh, individual equalities and rights. And it's still expanding today, not all positive, some negative. But the essential motive is that everyone can have the right as a nation to, to, to govern, to, to choose its, its will under God, under, under God, one nation. You see, Independence Day celebrates these things just as Israel would celebrate coming out of captivity of Egypt. And in 1948, we have Israel recognised as, as a state of Israel, the nationhood, so to speak, was recognised in that year. Independence Day for 1948 for Israel is celebrated every year. And so this is what we're doing on July the 4th. We're recognising those who lay down their lives and we get to celebrate the freedom that we have in this nation. And we pray that that freedom continues, amen? amen. But when it comes to the Kingdom of God, independence is not in God's vocabulary. Independence is almost antichrist. Independence is all about me, myself and I. Independence says I don't need God or I don't need others. Independence has this connotation, if you like, of doing it my way, sort of Frank Sinatra vibes, you know? Like, look what I did, look what we did. I didn't need anyone else. I didn't need God's help. I can just do life my way. These are sort of the values that this generation uh, purports forward of, of look, at, look at what I did did and so independence in the kingdom it's it's not there it's there in terms of Galatians 5 verse 1 it was for freedom that Christ set us free it was for freedom that Christ set us free and so the beauty of God is that He gives us free will and that's probably the closest thing to independence if you like. But when we get that independence, we need to throw that independence back and depend on God. And so this cycle of dependence and independence goes on and on and on. I give you free will to choose who you love, what you do with your life, what you do with your time. And God desires that you take that independence and you recognise the one who set you free and gave it to you, that you throw your dependence back on the rock of ages. Can I get an amen? <laughs> See, Banning Leipzig says this about independence. He says, independence and isolation may be natural in our culture, but they are countercultural to Christianity. Christianity simply doesn't work in isolation and independence. It only works in the context of community. Community of others and the community of the Trinity. God was never Mr. Independent. God, mutuality and beauty and harmony works together. And it's that illustration and that model that we should display to others. Of course, there is a natural dependence that we also should have. You know, it's okay to be dependent on others sometimes. We all have that in stages of our life. It's unhealthy to be dependent on someone to the point that you, you need them all the time, you can't function. That's not healthy. But, but let me read you this from the great John Stott. He says, God's design for our life is that we should be dependent. We come into this world totally dependent on the love, care and the protection of others. We go through a phase in life when other people depend on us. And most of us will go out of this world totally dependent on the love and care of others. Someone's gonna look after you one day. You're gonna need somebody someday to help you go to the bathroom maybe, to, 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 to wash your clothes, to help you get up the stairs. This is not evil, a destructive reality. It is part of the design, part of the physical nature that God has given us. I sometimes hear old people, including Christian people, who should know better say, I don't wanna be a burden to anyone else. I'm happy to carry on living so as long as I can look after myself, but as soon as I become a burden, I would rather die. 
But this is wrong. We are all designed to be a burden to others. You are designed to be a burden to me and I'm designed to be a burden to you. And the life of the family, including the life of the local church family, should be one of mutual burdensomeness. Carry each other's burdens, the Bible says. And in this way, you will fulfil the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2. Christ Himself takes on the dignity of dependence. (laughs) He is born a baby, totally dependent on the care of His mother. He needs to be fed. He needs to uh, have His diaper changed. He needs to be held up when He rolls over. And yet He never loses His divine dignity. And at the end on the cross, He again becomes totally dependent, limbs pierced and stretched, unable to move. So in the person of Christ, we learn that dependence does not, cannot deprive a person of their dignity or their supreme worth. And if dependence was appropriate for the God of the universe, it is certainly appropriate for us. It's okay. It's okay to lower your pride and say, I need help. It's okay to say, I'm in a spot right now. Can you you give me a hand up? It's okay to be transparent with your flaws. One of the most liberating things you can do, and even as a pastor and a leader, is tell people that you haven't got it all together, that you need help, that you need others in your life, that you need the dependence of others to encourage you at times. Dependence is not evil. God wants you to depend on Him and He wants you to depend on others and He wants you to carry each other's burdens. This sermon's going a whole different direction to the last one. You see, Abraham was promised, a promise that he shall surely be blessed and multiply. He waited patiently for that promise. God said to Abraham, I want you to take your son, take that son of promise, take your promise and give it back to me. Take it up the mountain, take your boy with a load of wood and put him on top of that wood, bind him on that wood and I want you to sacrifice him, kill him and give him to me. Abraham, paraphrase Genesis chapter 22, says to the guys at the base of the mountain, we'll be back and we'll be worshipping with you. God, Abraham knows with a certainty that God is not a liar. That God is not a man that he should lie. Point number one, Hebrews chapter six, God doesn't lie. That should be the most comforting statement that you hear today. Because if God lies, it's all over. But God does not lie. When He says something, it's going to happen, period. When He speaks over your life as a child, it's going to happen. No man can stop it. No woman can get in front of it. No parent abuse or dissatisfaction or disillusionment. Nothing, no obstacle can stop the favour and the promises of God over your life. How does Abraham have such faith? You see, Abraham's not just going up there thinking, oh my gosh, I'll just try this out. You know, I hope it turns out okay. Sort of hopeful faith. That ain't hopeful faith. That's not faith at all. Faith is being assured of what we do not see. The evidence of what we do not see. The substance of things hoped for, the Bible says. And so he knows that God is not going to disappoint. And even if he has to kill Isaac, for some way, some manner, he's going to raise him up from the dead. The promises over Abraham's life that I will bless you, surely, surely, surely bless you, are going to take place. He has that amount of faith. It's interesting to note that Moses had all the law and felt short of the promises of God and the promised land. He didn't enter. Abraham did not have the law and yet it pleased God and it was a credit to his bank account, his life as righteousness. Sometimes the more you know about something, the less you believe. (laughs) 
God has a track record with Abraham. When He says, go from this land to that land, in Genesis chapter 12, now the Lord said to Abraham, go. That means lek leka in Hebrew, lek leka. Everyone say lek leka. From your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Okay, he moves out of Babylonia, the Ur of the Chaldeans, and he goes to the Mesopotamian fertile crescent, beautiful lands, and he starts setting up and establishing himself. And his family is multiplying. He's now military of 400, and he's got flocks and wells and lands. And everything is going beautiful for Abraham. And then comes the test of his. Allegiance. You see, I found in God that when you get to a place of comfortability, when all you get your ducks in order and you've got your nice little house and your picket white fence religion, quote Corey Asbury, you should expect and wait for the test of God because He likes to ruffle your feathers when things get comfortable. He comes to Abraham and says, oh, you've got your promise and your son now. Are you ready for the test of all tests? Because God is testing you right now, whether you recognise it or not. He's not just testing you for test's sake. He's testing you because He wants your heart and He wants all of you. Why? Because God is a jealous God. He's not narcissistic. He puts you before Himself. He just wants your heart. He wants you. He wants everything about you because He's passionately in love with you. God has a track record. So when Abraham hears for the second time, go and take your son up the mountain, he hears the Hebrew words lek leka. And he's reminded that God brought me out of the land of Babylonia once before and He blessed me and He blessed my family and He has been good to me. He has been kesed, kesed, Hebrew word, steadfast love. He has not let me down and He has surely blessed me. Surely the second time I know the nature and character of God. I can be certain when I hear lek lek, oh, that's the word go, 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 that His promises shall be yes and amen the second time around. It's not whimsical. It's not just, I'll try this out. It's not capricious. He knows the character and the heart of God. Do you know the character and the heart of, do you know the Word of God? Is it in you so much? Have you got a track record with God that when you look back, you go, remember the goodness of God? In John 20, 27, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Oh, you believe because you've seen, Thomas, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You see, Thomas, he wasn't condemned, but Thomas had to see to believe. He had to see it to believe it. Abraham, he didn't have to see it. He believed before he saw it. As we've been worshipping and singing about It's the day of dependence. The church needs to get back to depending on God. And I'm not talking parts of your life, I'm talking about your whole life. You need to depend on God for your children. You need to depend on God for your business, for your finances. You need to depend on God for that lost soul away, that child and that daughter. You need to depend like your life matters. He matters. His promises are yes and amen on your life. You cannot see it, but He surely will bless you. But you have to wait patiently. Patiently. I don't want to hear that word, God. Today, I just want to encourage you. I want to remind you that the profundity is in the simplicity of God's statements and nature. Take this, be encouraged over this summertime when all things can break loose sometimes that God is much kinder than you think. Point number two. God is much kinder than you think. God has always been kind. He's the epitome of kind. He's the epitome of love. He just doesn't do loving things. He is love. He just doesn't give you promises. He is the promise. Some of you are holding on too tightly to your promise. You forgot the promise giver. See, when you start idolising the promise, you forget your resource. You start depending on the things, on the words, rather than the one who spoke the words. 
That's a whole nother story. Look at the promises of God over your life. Do you idolise promises or do you idolise Him? See, God gives us all kinds of illustrations in this life. I just come back from a 35, 40 hour plane trip from Australia and back. How many people want to go to Australia one day? All of you. (laughs) Not quite. See, you all want to go to Australia. But when I tell you how long it takes, (laughs) you do you, boo. I'm staying here. (laughs) 14 hours, my goodness gracious me, I can't do 14 hours. I mean, four hours to LA, that's enough to me, man. I'm just, man, I'm checking out after 14 hours. What do you do? And the spiders, I don't want the spiders or the snakes. You can have all that back in Australia. Good gracious. That's my best. I don't even know what that accent was. But plane rides that long, it's like a snapshot of life concocted in 14 hours of a, of a cabin, of a plane suspended in the air. It's, it's a snapshot of, of real life. You know, I travel coach class. Where's my coach travellers at right now? Yeah, you yeah, know. But, but when you got children, <laughs> you try flying 14 hours with children in seats that don't, you see, I love it. It all starts out beautiful. The baby's born in life. Oh, it's rejoicing. And then the baby grows up. (laughs) And life smacks you in the face. You see, people get on the plane, they're so well dressed and the best outfits and the handbags and they're racing to stuff their stuff up there first and they're racing to get first in line and everybody wants to be first and seated and then they realise you've got to sit here for 14 hours. Why am I rushing for? Someone comes in, lady, you still stand up and move and let them in. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. You know, and everything's nice and the meal's brought out early and you get this hot wash towel. And it's just, you know, all this is an experience. You look at the window and you're the, the sunset and you look at the wing and oh, wow. You chat to the person next to you, introduce yourself. In fact, I had a great encounter uh, with with, with someone who uh, I shared the gospel with. They said, what do you do? I say, I motivate people. You motivate people. What do you motivate people to do? I motivate people to Jesus. Whoa. (laughs) Sometimes I say, I'm a teacher. What do you teach? I teach the truth. What? (laughs) You wanna know it? You had a bad experience with God growing up as a girl in school. I said, you know what, I I preached a message on women in ministry, you ought to listen to it. She's listening to that message right now and she's gonna give her heart to Jesus one day, just sowing seeds. Anyway, back to the plane trip. Two hour, three hour, you know, things are nice, settling in, maybe watch a movie, read a book, whatever you do. You know, and things are good. It's by the seventh, eighth, Ninth hour, something happens. People start losing their minds and their dignity. Sister Susie, who's in her best Armani suit, all of a sudden puts her track pants off, takes her shoes off, feet up on the seat, face masks, drooling down her face. The kid behind me is kicking my seat for four hours straight. My kid vomited on the plane, no word of a lie, vomited. Yeah, people, real life. Put that on your Instagram, I dare you to. The lights are so bright and the screens are so bright, even with your face mask, you're waking up and the announcement that it's so loud where I sit for some reason. And there's this draft, it's so cold, I can't feel my feet. I've slept 10 minutes in 14 hours. I got earplugs and headphones on headphones and I'm still waking up. And to top it all off, the person next to me thinks that I'm a human pillow. A stranger is sleeping on me. 
and we're all one big happy family. (laughs) You can easily lose sight of the promise and the goal 35,000 feet up suspended in a cabin with a whole bunch of strangers and a place you don't really wanna be for a whole lot of long time until you land. (laughs) When I landed and my children ran up to Nanny and Papa and their embrace and the tears and the joy and the emotion and the connection. Do you think for a moment that I was thinking about the kid kicking me in the back of the seat or the lack of sleep I had or the disturbance of my child vomiting? I was in utter joy. The Bible says that for the joy set before Him, Jesus endured the cross. Sometimes you need to tell yourself between LA and Sydney, for the joy set before me, I'll endure this plane ride. Because whoever told you that the pursuit of happiness was kingdom-like, have missed it. Of course, we all wanna be happy and happiness is beautiful. But as a Christian, your goal is not to pursue happiness. Your goal is to pursue truth. And that truth is in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you, you're gonna get a whole lot of happiness and joy in Him. But you're also gonna get a whole lot of pain and a whole lot of stuff that you don't want. And it's gonna be somewhat, you know, it's gonna test your nth degree and your patience. Your plain ride of life will test every fruit of the Spirit. You see, I wanna encourage you. If you find yourself in a place right now where you're like, yeah, I relate to that. Just getting through, man. Just getting through. I want you to know that God hasn't finished with you or your circumstance yet. When God puts the Word of God together, the Bible, the Scriptures, oftentimes we have contradictions in our hearts or apparent seemingly disjointedness of man. How does that work with the nature of God and the, these cognitive dissonance, uh, you know, that we, we find ourselves in these tensions between man, is that God and how could Jesus and like man war and child sacrifice and like, I don't understand God. Whenever you find yourself in a place of, I don't understand, keep on reading. Keep on reading. I want to tell you about the kindness of God and how it unfolds in Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. It says this, this is the law to Israel. I could do a whole sermon on these things. If there is a dispute between men and women, uh, men, and they come into court and the judges decide between them, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty, then if the guilty man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence with a number of stripes in proportion to his offence. Forty stripes may be given him, but not more, lest if one should go on to beat him with more stripes than these, your brother be degraded in your sight. Apparently, 40 lashes flogging a man for being guilty of a small offence was kindness of God, was the kindness of God. If you hear that today, you're going, um, you can have your God, I'll do me. Because that doesn't seem so kind. Jesus, 40 lashes minus one, that's the whole thing. He's not like any other man. But there's, there's a lot of things tied into this. It's kind when you compare it to all the surrounding pagan nations of the time. Scholars say that the Egyptians had a rule too. Do you know what their rule was? You were allowed to give a guilty man 200 lashes and five open wounds. Now, God seems kind. 
God seems kind amidst the culture in which He is displaying the original kindness of His nature that always was. But He's doing it in incremental steps. One, to relate. Two, to preserve the dignity of humanity. It says there, to preserve your brother. There is things that God is protecting people from shame, from fear, from the degradation of self and flesh that God is instituting throughout the Scriptures for women, for children, for slaves, for the oppressed, for minorities. He starts with the vulnerable and He works His way forward. That is the trajectory of Scripture. Isn't it a beautiful thing to know that God has not finished yet? It's not God's ideal yet, but it's a perfect law for the perfect culture for that time in which God wants to display that He's kinder than everybody else. It's actually grace. So when we get to John in the first chapter and we hear the grace upon grace, the Jews understood that the Old Testament was gracious to them. How much more is the New Testament gracious to us? You see, the fulfilment of the trajectory is in Jesus Christ. Stay with me. Are you with me right now? The fulfilment is so much higher. It is a higher standard, but it is a a seemingly more kind result. But God has always been kind. You see, Jesus in Matthew 5 explains all these things from 39 to 44. Jesus taught that we should turn the other cheek now. If someone has, uh, you have an offence against somebody, turn the other cheek. Don't give them 40 lashes. And if anyone takes your tunic, give him your cloak as well. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We've come a long way in the kindness spectrum. Now we're turning the other cheek and we're giving them stuff. I was ministering in Australia for a weekend at my father-in-law's church. Man was having a hard time forgiving the person. It just keeps coming back, he says. It just, stuff starts triggering me. I feel like I've forgiven, then I'll go a good three months and then it just, ah, and then I wanna, you know. I, I said, that, that's okay, that's okay, that's only natural. But keep laying it down at the feet of Jesus. But here I encourage you to do a second thing. Go and bless the person that offended you. Because you know you're truly free when you can go and bless them. Go and give them something. Rock up on their door with a gift or whatever it is. Send them a car, I don't know, whatever it is. And watch it set you free. This is the standard of the New Testaments. Not protest your grievances on social media against people. Turn the other cheek. Give them a cloak. Give them something extra when they have cursed you. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus reveals the ultimate meaning of the law of God for those whose righteousness must exceed the legal experts of the Pharisees. It's higher. Philip Hughes says this, man as created was not what he finally would be. Human's destiny was to advance from glory to glory and that even if there had been no fall of sin at all, The end was designed to be even more splendid than the beginning. Oh, I love that. The end was designed to be even more splendid than the beginning. Paul then picks up post-Christ and things still aren't ideal in Paul's day. Christ has died, He's fulfilled the law, He's done the finished work of the cross, but it's still being incrementally displayed within culture. Could it be that the things of God are still incrementally, although suddenly and have done at one moment, are still incrementally being improved and seeming kinder in your life day by day and you are missing it because you are looking at the supposed unkindness of God. What do you do when you can't understand? Keep on moving. Keep on reading and keep on believing. 
I don't understand. I'm in this crazy place right now. I feel like I'm out of control. This is disgusting. How did I get here? I'm so frustrated. I'm tired. God says, keep on moving, church. Keep on believing. Keep on reading my Word. I ain't finished with your story. I ain't finished with your family. I ain't finished with what I'm doing through you. My promises over your life will get glory and I will receive that. Will you keep believing that it's just the beginning? You say, I'm 70, 80 years of age in this place. God still has not finished with you. God is still redeeming and reframing the circumstances and the position of your heart. He never stops until that day where you'll be with Him in that perfect place when there'll be no need for that. It's an already but not yet proposition. Jesus has finished, declare it over your life, but let the incremental work of the Spirit of God do its thing as only He can do. And if you believe that, give Him some praise in this place this morning. Stand to your feet in the house. Number one, God does not lie. Number two, God is much kinder than you think. Number three, all along, God is testing your surrender. He is testing your surrender. God tests every character in the Bible and it's no different for us, not just for test's sake. Romans 2.4 says this, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. What is repentance? Yeah, it can mean letting go of all your sin and all your garbage, but it's more than that. It's letting go and then it's turning to Him because He's so passionately in love with you that He wants you to know His character like He tried to display to Abraham and He did. And Abraham believed His character was good even when the promise of all promises, the thing He loved the most was to be given back up. You know, when your surrender is where it's meant to be, when you can offer the promise back up to God, when you can offer your gifts back up to God, when you can offer all you have back up to God, you're a free man and you're a free woman. As soon as you hold on to that and say, it's mine, You have robbed yourself of the joy of the Lord and the fulfilment of the promises of God over your life. He comes to those who surrender. You see, there's this dynamic with Jesus and the Father that I love because it's it's this dynamic that He never leaves the Father's sight and He listens to the Father's words and He never acts without the Father. He is the model of surrender. He is the model of of, of fearing His Father in awe and reverence that sometimes we forget because, oh, He's just Jesus and He can just do it. But we see in John 7, 28, Jesus cries out, yes, you know me and you know where I'm from. I'm not here on my own, but He who sent me is true. You do not know Him, but I know Him because I am from Him and He sent me. The Greek word know means to be aware, to behold. And the Greek word from para means beside or by the side. Jesus is always beside the Father. In John 10, 37, He says, But if I do the works of my Father, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. John 12, 44, When a man believes in me, He does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. He's so connected to the presence of his Father. So dependent on his words every day, every moment, where he should go, who he should minister to when He should pray in the mountains, when He should minister to the people. I don't speak unless the Father speaks through me. You see, this is the safe haven we have in God. 
and child therapists and all kinds of psychologists will tell you attachment theories and all kinds of things that if a child does not have a safe haven in their father, in their family, that when they go out to explore the world and all its fears, they will have no place to retreat. And so they'll put their faith or their trust in other people and other persons. And that's when they get hurt, when they should return home to their father and their mother as that safe place. All of a sudden they get abused and all kinds of things. Nicholson in 91 said this, without these father surrendered dependent experiences, individuals commonly experience clinical syndromes such as overburdened self, ripe with anxiety, suspiciousness, paranoia, and ultimately a sense that the world is a threatening and unsafe place. Those who are deprived of childhood idealising experiences may exhibit an ideal hungry personality whereby they constantly search for those who they can merge with to provide soothing and calming functions. Jesus says, my Father is all that to me. And as I have modelled that in the Father, you are to model that with me. You are to be utterly dependent on my words. You are to be utterly dependent on my spirit. You are to wake up every day. Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to speak to? Where do you want me to lead? It's a level of dependence that the church needs. The church needs to go to this place where you stop running your own agendas and your own dreams and goals that that you've idolised and your busyness and you stop and you go, am I dependent on God or am I just self-fulfilling all the promises that He gave me? That's the question I ask myself every day. And to be honest, there are areas in my life where I'm still self-reliant. Gifts, talents, skills, finances, whatever it is you can do, you've got this, you know how to do this. Where is the room for the Spirit of God to do anything? We have this in our churches across America. We've got it all together, all packaged. We know how to do this. We know how to draw a crowd. We know how to excite them. We know how to get numbers and find it. We know how, we've got it all in our skills and aptitude. And God goes, well, you're doing pretty good down there. Seems like you don't need me. Until you do. Until you do. And everybody has that moment one day. Everybody will have that moment when you realise that you ain't gonna get you through. And your intelligence ain't gonna get you through the future. And your giftings ain't gonna get you through your future. And who you know and your influence ain't gonna get you through the days ahead. God is sifting His church, He's sifting the world and He's finding out like the Abrahams, like the Abrahams. Do you fear me? Do you depend on me really? Because if you lost it all, we're singing songs. Even if it all falls down, if it all falls down, are you still good? I'm good. I hope you can say yes. I hope you can hear my heart today. It's not of condemnation if it's encouragement. It's to say, hey, come on church. When we depend on Him, watch God go upon the promises of what He's given us to do on this earth. That is to reach the lost. That is to seek and save that which is lost as Christ did. That is to listen to Him, obey Him. And I wanna hear these words that Abraham heard in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 11. These words, in a good way, they follow me. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am, God. I've given you everything. I gave you my son. And he says, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Underline it, highlight it. Let it chase you all the days of your life. 
I know that you fear God. I know that you fear me. I know that you fear me. I know that you put me first. I know that I'm all that you want. You gave me the promise. You gave it back to me. I gave it to you. You gave it back to me. I gave you independence. And you gave that dependence, independence back to me. And you depended on me for everything. Now you fear me. You fear me above man's opinions. You fear me above your material possessions. You fear me above the blessing. You want me more than you want the blessing. And that's what I'm after. That is the Bible. That is it, amen. If you're gonna give Him some praise, give Him some good praise. Give Him some good praise. Give Him some good praise. It's a test of your allegiance. It's a test of your allegiance. It's a test of your heart. God doesn't ask us to do anything that He hasn't done Himself. God sympathises in our weakness. God knows, God knows He comes into our pain. He comes into our strife. He comes into our torment. He comes into our grief. He's not a God distant. He knows everything. He says, you can depend on me. Why? Because I've done it myself. So where did you do it, God? Where did you do it? In my Son, Jesus Christ, on that cross over 2,000 years ago, bled and died for your salvation and the torment and the pain and the grief that He would exude blood from His own skin under the stress that He was under. You talk about stress. Jesus knows, He knows, and He would not ask you to do anything that He has never done Himself or experienced. And you're in this room today and you don't know Jesus. You don't know Him like your personal Saviour and Lord. I'm not talking about growing up in church. I'm not talking about attending. I'm talking about, are you saved? Do you know and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life? Is He leading you or are you doing life the way that you want to do it? Because today Jesus wants to come into your life and says, you can depend on me. I said to the girl on the plane next to me, everybody wants someone like Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Everybody wants someone like Jesus to follow. Do you know Jesus? I'm not talking about the way that the church paints Him sometimes. I'm talking about a King who describes Himself the only time in Scripture as gentle and humble in heart. The only time He speaks of His character, Jesus says, I am gentle and I am humble in heart. Who doesn't wanna follow that type of person? I don't wanna follow proud and arrogant. Got it all together. Yeah, Jesus has, He's perfect, but He says, I am humble and I am gentle. And He invites you right now to say, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, heavy laden, and I will give you the rest that your soul needs and can only find in me.